Okay, as you remember the Snoopy protocol, Snoopy protocol based its operations on broadcast medium. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a bus as long as you have broadcast capability, you can have Snoopy protocol. Okay, and for the cache blocks, there can be activities happening inside of each CPU which make the state to change. Okay, and, and we have seen this. If you have a, uh, if you don't have that line yet, a CPU read will bring that line in and put it in shared state. Whether or not there are other CPUs using this block. And if, however, there's a CPU write to a non-existing line, then that activity will bring the line in and put it in exclusive state. And in the meantime, place write miss on bus to notify the other nodes that you can no more use that line. Okay? So for a shared block, if you want to write to it, same thing, you have to tell the others that you cannot use it anymore. So still put the right miss on the bus for the same purpose using the existing line. Although the signal should have been something else. But since this signal can achieve the same purpose, so why not just use it? Okay, so for an exclusive line, whether that's a f uh, subsequent read hit or write hit, it stays in the exclusive state. And this is, this should be here. This should be if I want to replace this line. Okay, then I'll do something. So this is more difficult for you to understand. Maybe it shouldn't be here. No better way to express this situation. So this is difficult to explain, but you should know what it means. Okay, if you are sitting at home, but your peer CPUs are doing something which may affect your cache line states, then this state transition diagram tells you what these are. And you should have read this already. Okay, then the cache, uh, the block replacement state diagram. Where do we have replacements? Let me call everything out first. Okay, so we have these replacements here, here, and here. We've seen this before. Now we take a second look at this. So if you have a line in exclusive state and this line is going to be replaced, then you issue a CPU write miss signal to your peer CPUs and then you need to write this line back to the memory. Okay? And then you bring in a new line and put it in exclusive state. So this is a write replacement for existing exclusive line. Or if it's from invalid, if it's a CPU read miss, then you do this. If it's a shared and the CPU read miss, then you do this. <coughs> okay, so now we have replacement for invalid line, for shared line, and for exclusive line due to different reasons. Okay, it could be CPU write, CPU write, but we should concentrate on the replacements. These are the replacements. These three are the replacements. Okay, these for these two red arrowheads, there are no replacement. Shouldn't be on this page. So it's very important that you understand 
what's really going on in your system in order to be able to read these diagrams. Otherwise, it's very confusing. Okay, so we put all three transition diagrams together and get this. Okay, putting all together and get this. Could there be mistakes in it? The answer is yes. There are always possible mistakes. For the known people, it's very obvious. If you don't really understand, maybe you take it as a truth, try to memorize it, and never can figure out what's going on. Okay, so you should always try it. How? Using tables like this. In the exam, we had this, right? So you try them out and actually see how things happen and then you're done. Okay, I always emphasize true understanding. Otherwise, I always can pack you with information, drown you in the bunch of information and you never really understand what's going on. And in conclusion, Remember, we talked about vector operations. So one instruction operates on vectors of data, input, input, output, okay? And vector loads get data from memory into big registers, operate, and then vectors store. Okay, so if the vector is very huge, then there is no use for the cache. A cache would only sit in between increasing overhead to your operation. Okay, so usually for the vector computers, we don't use data vector cache or vector data cache. What about scalar data cache? That still helps. But how, how can you tell if you're Accessing scalar data or vector data, how can you tell? Why well, you might be using different instructions. So one more signal going out from the CPU can tell the memory whether the access data should be cached where. Okay, very easy thing to do. Get the idea? No? So what's your question? Okay, so we have this. You see, we have vector add. Okay, maybe vector register 0, 1, 2, and we also may have scalar add. Register 0, 1, 2. Okay, can you tell which ones are scalar data, which ones are vector data? In this very obvious example, it's easy, right? So for my CPU, whenever I want to issue load, store, uh, uh, sorry, load or store, this is uh, address, and this is data lines. I can add yet another control signal saying, now I'm loading vector or scalar. Just re like read not write signal. Okay, yet another control signal to tell the memory I'm accessing vector or scalar data. And then Cache only the scalar data, but not the vector data. Very easy hardware can help. So is there a so-called correct way to design your hardware? Standard way? Maybe not. You need to know what you need and what you can do better. Okay, and then? Index load store for sparse matrix uh, for this kind of cases, 
uh, for sparse matrix cases, we can do gather and scatter to make the vector hardware more efficient and easy to add vector to commodity instruction set. Okay, like the MMX SSE instruction set extension. Okay, we add some vector extension instructions to a commodity, a popular commercialized instruction set. And vector is very efficient architecture for very, uh, vectorizable codes, including multimedia and many scientific codes. And multimedia uses are becoming more and more popular. So we stress on uh, more on these than the others. OK, and then for the uniprocessor, the speed up line, the speed up curve is flattening. So we have to go to the multiprocessor way sooner or later. In fact, we started the study of multiprocessing in the 60s, long, long time ago. And today, the problems, all the research issues still remain the same. Nothing is really new. Only the physical parameters change. OK? Have you heard of consistency? Have you heard of uh, like uh, time sharing, multi-programming, parallelizing, compiler? All the research issues still remain the same. And parallelism challenges include percentage of code that's parallelizable. And whenever you go to memory, Remember, when you have many processors, then the shared memory will be placed further and further away. So remote memory access becomes a big issue. So how do you arrange the memory modules? How do you place them? It can be centralized or it can be distributed. And how do you share information among processes. It can be message passing or it can be shared addressing. Okay, this talks about memory organization and this talks about the programming mechanism for data sharing. Okay, and then we can do something on the hardware side to help. To help bring data co closer to each node without having the software to worry about it. And that's the so-called coherent cache. OK, so this is a pure hardware method. Also, you heard of memory consistency. That's some kind of the OS job to order the read-write or write-read-rather relationships to regulate which write should be seen by which read after how long. Okay. So snooping is one way, and we will see the directory-based method, which makes the cache coherence mechanism more scalable. What do we mean by scalability? Always it means when we have more processors, more and more and more processors. What's the problem with snooping? For instance, if we have hundreds of processors, now thousands of processors, someday hundreds of thousands of processors, snooping will have to make all the processors be intervened, be interrupted. When, whenever there is a cache coherent activity. Okay, so everybody will have to be interrupted. Hundreds and thousands of them, making the performance extremely low, especially for the broadcast medium. Okay, so we know how serious this is, and the consistency and the right serialization problem is more of a 
of an OS issue, so I'll not talk about it. Okay, unless you have questions for me. Okay, let me show you how a compiler looks like, and then maybe that can answer your question, although not directly. This is a compiler. There are many front ends. One front end for ADA, the other front end for BASIC, the other for C, the other for, well, the old D whatever, E whatever. OK, whatever language you have, I have a front end for you. And then this is the core of a compiler. And then these are the back ends. One is for maybe IBM CPU, HP CPU, Intel CPU, Apple CPU, we used to have Apple CPU, Motorola CPU, and whatever. Now you can, can you see the picture? For different language, I need to have a different parser, lexical analyzer to check the grammatic rules and to truly understand what the programmer wants to do. Okay, once I get that, it's in fact something like, a, like an expression tree. Just the description of the task, okay, in a somewhat universal way. Okay, so what matters is, what do you do? What do you really want to do? Okay, so once I know the task, then I try to map the task to some kind of standardized assembly form. Okay, this assembly doesn't belong to any particular CPU. It's somewhat standardized. Why? Because then it's easy for me to do this kind of mapping and to do all kinds of standard optimizations. Okay, after that, then I need to worry about what CPU, exactly which one I'm using. So I translate this somewhat standardized assembly to particular CPU assembly. OK, would that be easier to do so? Because it's already in somewhat a CPU uh, and assembly form, standardized. Then I translate it to a specific CPU's assembly form. And then later, I translate it into binary code or executable form. OK, so this is how a compi what a compiler is about. You see, I need to scan the program parse the program, lexically analyze the program, okay, to know what the task really is. So this belongs to the front end. I need one of such, such thing for language A, yet another one for language B, Yet another one for language C, one for each particular high-level programming language. Okay, and then this will be the core of my compiler shared by all kinds of high-level languages plus low-level low level CPU languages. Okay, 
And this, I need one of such thing for CPU A, yet another one for CPU B, yet another one for CPU C, and so on. Okay, is that enough? Not yet. What about vectorization? Vectorization, maybe I have Ada plus plus, which has vector extension. Some languages have some vector extensions or directives. Okay, if so, then I need to have a plus plus version also for that language such that programmer can specify vector data type operation in his program. Okay, so maybe here I also need to have some vector extension in my core. And for my CPU, if it doesn't handle any vector, then I have to go back to the scalar type executable or however if I do then I will again need to have vector extension for that CPU okay does that answer your question okay so how much compiler can do to help vectorize your code it depends. Depends on how good a compiler you have. But in order to vectorize your code, your compiler should at least be able to recognize vector operations. Maybe it's not very smart, but it should at least accept those kind of commands. Okay, so let's go on. Lecture 13. Implementation complication. When there are writes from different CPUs, I have a multiprocessor system. This is my memory. CPU has cache inside, but what if I want to write and you also want to write? then which one gets to update the memory first matters. Okay, so that's the so-called write race. When it happens, how do you determine the order of the writes because the second, second write will leave the information in that memory space permanently. So for every write, you have to arbitrate for bus. Get hold of the memory first. Get your right to write memory, okay? And then place miss on bus and complete operation. Tell all the others that you're writing, okay? So these write races usually mean write to the same memory address. If there are two different addresses, maybe I don't care that much. Okay, but however, if they're to the same address, then I do care. So if miss occurs to block while waiting for bus, then we need to handle the miss first. Okay, and then restart. However, in order to speed my system up a little more, Let's see what uh, a smart designer might do. Let me give you another of this picture. As you know, memory is very slow. So if I want to access to memory and wait for its response to come back, it takes hundreds of CPU cycles. And during these hundreds of cycles, usually the bus is 
occupied by this transaction. Others cannot use the bus. Is it smart? No, it's not smart because during the course of this memory access, maybe there are 300 cycles, but I use the bus to transmit my address to the memory, maybe data or so, and then wait for the data to come back, or maybe no data to come back because there's a store. So I'm simply waiting for the memory to complete the operation, and nothing will happen at the end. And during this course of memory access, 99% or even more of the time, the bus is sitting there idling. Yet no one else can use the bus. Is that smart? Of course not. So a smarter design may say, OK, this bus transaction is made splittable. So A, you want to use it here, and perhaps later here. Then what about if we let B to use it? When the bus is sitting there simply idling, let C to use it. Okay, and B may get its response back later, and C may get its response back later. Okay, so everyone is happy, and all the three transactions will take only a little bit longer than one single transaction. That's the so-called split bus transaction design. If we have split transaction bus, then things get more complicated. Must support the intervention and the invalidation. OK, looks like you're not very interested in this topic. I'll stop here. So any questions so far? No? Let's go on. In implementing snoo snooping protocol, the requirements are the first three. Multiple processors must be on some broadcast medium. Doesn't have to be bus. Access to both addresses and data. They both should be able to be seen by all. And add a few new commands to perform coherence in addition to read and write. OK, so we have start to have something like invalidate the others. Before that, I have. I cannot, I cannot intrude into other CPU's cache and do anything. But now I can. I want Q to invalidate which line because I'm going to write to it. Okay? And processor continuously snoop on address bus. In order not to miss anything, you have to snoop on the bus all the time Although this snooping mechanism can be independent, designing your cache controller, and your cache can still interact with CPU <laughs> as normal, but very likely there will be interventions in between. So your performance is pulled down anyway. Okay. Every bus transaction checks cache tax. CPU accesses could be interfered. So how does the snooping mechanism do its job? Very easy. I have a cache. The cache has tags and data. The snooping mechanism, Snoopy? <laughs> Charlie Brown's Snoopy always checks the tag. Always checks the tag. However, CPU also wants to access to the tag to do tag comparison. So there is interference. What can you do? Usually what we do is we duplicate cache. And let the Snoopy to check the green copy of the tag and CPU use the white copy of the tag as usual so as not to pull the performance down. Okay? When do we need to have two cache uh, tags? You need to know that in order to be uh, suitable 
designer, cash designer, or even the programmer. Being a programmer, you need to know whether you have two copies of cash or not. Okay. So for symmetric shared memory, multiprocessor, and snooping protocol, there are limitations. Single memory accommodate all CPUs, so usually we like to bank the memory. Make the memory consists of many modules, so hopefully multiple accesses could go to multi different modules. And bus-based multiprocessors, bus must uh, if it's a bus-based system, then bus must support both coherence traffic and normal memory traffic, meaning more lines or contention will occur. Or perhaps we can do better. We can do, use some kind of network or multi use multiple buses to share the traffic load, but that makes the operation more complicated. You need to somehow synchronize the multiple buses for some particular events. And the worst of all, we cannot have too many processors in such a system. So in conclusion, for such a system, cache performance is a combination of uniprocessor cache miss traffic and traffic caused by communication, in other words, coherence operations. So remember, we have three kinds of misses in traditional uniprocessor cache, which is called the three C's. One C is compulsory miss. You have never used this piece of information, so you have to miss it in. Okay, the second is cap capacity. The cache is used for because it's small enough. So there must be space limitation. And if the miss is due to the limited space, then that's called capacity miss. And then due to the confined associativity, sometimes even though there are other spaces available, yet two cache lines will have to contend for the same cache line space. That's called the conflict. Now we have the fourth C joining the club, which is the coherence miss. Nothing to do with me, but somebody else want me to invalidate my line. So next time you want to use it, it's a miss. Okay, so we have four C's. Coherence misses could be categorized into two types. Let's see what happens. Come on, say something. Tell me how big is a cache line? We have tag, of course. How big is a cache line? 32 bytes. Capital B. <laughs> OK, so I have 32 bytes in a line. Somebody writes to this block. Somebody writes to this byte. That caused my whole line to be invalidated. So next time when I want to use this word, you see, still I don't know how large a word is. But anyway, if I want to use my word later on, I cannot find it. It's invalidated. OK, so do you think that sharing is absolutely necessary? No. No, it's just because this byte and this word happen to be in the same line. However, if, my, if I make my line smaller, every line contains only a byte, and the smallest accessible memory data type is a byte. OK, we seldom see bit accessible memory. <laughs> OK, the smallest is a byte. If that's my cache line size, then I will never have 
false sharing. Okay, so the false sharing is caused by something else other than myself in the same line. Invalidation is due to this byte, but I am the innocent victim. I got killed too. Okay, and I'm innocent. What locality? Spatial locality. <laughs> Plus the tax storage overhead is too, too large. Okay. For anything bad, there will be some bright sides. <laughs> okay, so now you understand what true sharing misses mean and what false sharing misses mean. Okay, so the true sharing misses arise from the communication of data through the cache coherence mechanism. Okay, so uh, forget about all the words. Tell me if I have a cache block that's that big, can there be true sharing misses? So what's the definition of true sharing misses? Here's the answer. If this is the reason for validation, for invalidation, and if this is the thing you want to access to, and found out that's a miss, then that's true sharing miss. So the true sharing miss doesn't have to do with the size of the block. It has to do with the piece of information that's causing the miss. Okay? So for this kind of design, the smallest possible cache line design, all the misses due to coherence will be true sharing. But if the cache line size is larger, then the miss could be a true sharing miss or it could be a false sharing miss. Now can you tell the difference? Okay, so let's go see a table. This table is error prone. <laughs> okay. At least I can find many errors in it. Try to debug it. Make sure you understand and try some example and, and then find out where are the mistakes. Okay, let me give you an example. Assume x1 and x2 in same cache block. P1, P2 both already have that block. Okay, so if P1 wants to write to x1, then there will be no miss at all, right? I have that line in the shared state. So when I read it, uh, I'm sorry, when I write to it, there'll be no miss. But I will invalidate x, y, and p2. So this is the first mistake. You go ahead and find the others. No time for further discussion. Okay, so this is somewhat like a summary. For cache coherent mechanism design, we must assign a set of yet another yet another set of unique states to our cache lines. Previously, our cache line has only valid invalid states. Now we need to have some others, and then we need to manage the protocol to make all the cache data coherent. Okay, so we have uh, these are the steps. Okay, so I'm not going to read this through. Okay, it may be important, I'll read it through. So manage cache, in order to manage cache coherence protocol, you need to first determine when to invoke coherence protocol. The snooping protocol, the snoopers, most of the time just snoop, but doesn't invoke any extra activities. Okay, but in case you need to, then find the information about state of block in other caches to determine action. And you need to locate the other copies. For the snooping protocol, you don't need to. You just tell everybody something has happened. Do something about it, okay? You don't need to know exactly which ones have to do what and communicate with those copies, okay? So 
all the coherence protocols need to do this, but the difference is lie in how you implement A and C. How do you know who has what? And how do you tell them what to do? Okay, so bus-based coherence, I just broadcast. I don't care. Okay, once I broadcast, my job is done. However, because of this broadcast requirement, the system cannot be too big. Or long network latency will be incurred. So conceptually, this is a very simple method, but in reality, most, com uh, most commercial designs, even for eight processors, 16 processors, don't use this. Already give up on this method. So how can we have a scalable coherence? Let me just show you a figure. Let's look at this figure directly without all the words. Okay, so this is a processor, this is the cache, this is just the regular cache. Yet for the memory, for every cache block sized memory block, this is the size of a cache block. I need to have a directory <laughs> entry for it saying who has this copy? And who is the owner of this copy? Okay, so whenever I want to do something like I need to write, then my write will go to the memory, and the memory will know which ones to invalidate based on this table. Okay? And sometimes, in order to speed up your execution speed, perhaps the cache can also keep the state of the cache lines coherent stage of the cache lines so that it knows whether it needs to communicate with the memory or not. It's just the improvement. Doesn't uh, contradict with the principle. Okay? So whenever you want to do something to the others, go back to here. You determine whether you want to do something to the others then you need to know where they are and what they have. Okay? And how to let them know what they need to do. Okay? And here in the directory protocol, we go to memory and check the directory. Check that table. Okay? Get the idea? So that's the only difference. Once I check the memory, directory, I know which ones to shoot at. No more broadcast. Directory can be distributed, can be anywhere, but it should be associated with the memory. So if your instructor tells you, yes, it's stored with the memory, you should know exactly what he means. Okay. Doesn't have to be physically adjacent to the memory, but it has to have some association with the memory. Memory itself can be banked. Directory itself can also be banked. Would you like to have a local copy? Like my, this time the system is very large in scale, so this is CPU zero, and this is CPU, da, 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 da. I can have thousands of thousands of CPUs, <laughs> okay? And then I have some kind of network, very complicated network, and then I have memory. Memory has its associated directory. Most of you cannot see that already, I'm sorry. Okay, so do you want to have a copy <laughs> of the directory of your own, it's up to you. <laughs> it's the implementation issue. But in principle, this is a directly based protocol. 
Okay, so now can you read this diagram? Okay. If other present bit says none, nil, then that means this memory line has not yet been cached anywhere else. Okay, and the dirty bit may mean only one has the exclusive copy, but has not write it back to memory yet. Okay, and you need more bits, it's up to you. So how do you know if the lines shared? How do you know if a line is exclusive? How can you tell? Right, but how do you check? What? Check the bits. Of course, always check the bits. <laughs> Don't try to fool me. <laughs> okay, if there are more than one present bit, then the lines got to be shared. Got it? Okay, if there's only one present bit, then what does that mean? That depends on whether the dirty bit is set or not. If only one has that line, who says it cannot be a shared line? Got it? But it's shared, it's not going to write it. But 30 bit is clear, so I know it's not dirty. What's the problem with you guy? Okay, now do you know how to play the game? Okay, think of your version as long as it works. Okay, and your version may be smarter than theirs. We haven't talked about how to save energy, how to speed things up, how to add parallelism because this directory looks like the bottleneck. Everybody will have to come and check. Looks like a bottleneck. So if Every line of mine can also carry the state of my line. Then perhaps if mine is shared, I don't need to go to the directory. Saving some bus uh, internet, uh, not internet, interconnection traffic. Okay? It might help if every cache line carries its own state with it. Okay? Think of some alternatives know what's exactly happening. Okay, so can I go on now? We're done with the directory <laughs> protocol. Advanced memory hierarchy. Let me give you a very brief review. Five minutes review. What's the top hierarchy? No? registers and then and then and then and then okay size wise speed wise Cost per bit wise, okay, managed by what? What manages the registers? Wrong. CPU is the dumbest thing in the world. It always does one thing at a time when it's been told to. <laughs> so it's compiler. What manages level one cache? What? Wrong. Level one cache is not even in the CPU. What? Too, too unclear. Memory. Right. Virtual memory management. What manages disk? 
You do? Okay, next time come to my office, help me do that. Tape? Similarly. Okay, so you understand this. Now, do you know how cash works? Easy. Four, four questions about the cash. Placement, replacement, and what? How do I know if something is in there? Identification. Okay, when it's full, which one to be replaced? And with right, right through, right back, right miss with allocation, right miss without allocation. Okay, four basic questions to be asked about the cache. And then nothing else. What about man memory? What then are the questions to be asked? Hey, come on, it's just the review. If you don't know this, don't come to this course. <laughs> what are the questions to be asked? What? The same four. <laughs> and what are the questions to be asked? <laughs> well, ask yourself. <laughs> So virtual memory works the same. Just this time, whenever there's a miss, the duration needed to handle the miss is billions of, at least millions of cycles. So we need to do some context switch to utilize, to make use of the various components of the computer system. Letting it sit there waiting is too wasteful, okay? That's why we need OS intervention, not intervention, OS help, okay? But for cache miss, it takes only cycles. You want to do context switch? Probably too long. Okay, because the context switch itself will take at least thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of cycles in order to switch out. And then again, switch something in. And then when you switch something new in, you'll find that cache has been flushed. I'm handling a cache miss, but not not, not this time. I flushed my whole cache. Everything's lost. You want to do context switch? Maybe not. Not only the duration for context switch in and out, but also you almost forget your original purpose of only missing in a cache line. Okay, you lost everything in your cache if your context switch. So that's why we don't do context switch on cache messages. And in order to be fast, we let hardware to do to handle cache messages. Okay, so for cache messages, you see, this is the background. Processor are speeding up as time goes very rapidly, yet the memory is not. So we need something to, to bridge the gap between these two curves. What did we invent? Cache memory. Cache memory is invented sometime in 1960-something and be used very widely starting from 1970. Okay. Today, almost all the systems have cache even though it shouldn't have one. Okay, so Basic cache optimizations include give reads priority over writes. So for a cache memory, do you remember we may have instruction cache and data cache or whatever? 
okay, the second level cache. So whenever the cache encounters one read miss, uh, encounters one read access and one write access, it should give priority to the read. Because a load loaded in data will be needed very soon. And second, avoid tra address translation during cache indexing. In other words, this is my virtual memory. Remember I told you? CPU is the dumbest thing in the world. You sent out, a, sent out an address. <laughs> When the address is sent out, page table intends to translate the address into a physical address. Cache also intends to translate this address, physical address or the translated virtual address, into cache usable form. So what's the cache usable form? Byte offset, index, and tag. Remember I told you, index doesn't have to be here. Index can be of any bit. OK, so if that's the case, if I want to use the index for my physical cache, then this index better fall within the range of untranslated part of my virtual address. In other words, I have a limited cache size available. That's what this is about. And to reduce miss penalty, I can use multi-level caches. And in, in order to reduce miss rate, I can use larger block size, or I should say appropriate block size. Block size being too large will increase the miss rate, okay, because it captures too much spatial locality, more than you need, so the miss rate will increase. Use larger caches, but caches should never be too large because Speed of the cache matters, especially for the level one cache. Okay? And use higher associativity to reduce conflict misses. So we have four C, uh, three C misses. Each one has some method to deal with. Okay? Those are the basic optimizations. Now we want to talk about the advanced cache optimizations. To reduce hit time, we can use small and simple caches. Small is fast, and simple is also fast. And then we can use weight prediction because we want to have higher associativity. So we may have two ways, four ways. How can you go directly to the most likely way? Many, many, many methods can do that. It's just prediction, so you could be wrong. But very likely, it's very easy to guess which way the next way should be. And then trace cache is more complicated. Well, maybe I'll explain to you right, right away. This is a cache line. How big is it? Remember? <laughs> maybe 32 bytes, maybe 64. Okay, let's make it even bigger. 34 uh, from 34 to 60, uh, 32 to 64 bytes. So for risk type instructions, I can store eight, eight, no, 16 instructions in a cache line. If it's 16 instructions from zero to 15, very likely. A jump jumps into the middle of the line, and then another jump jumps out. So the actually used portion of the line is only par partial, okay? 
would it be good if I store the beginning of my program and then followed by the second basic block as the control flow goes and then the third and then the fourth and then the fifth whoops have to clip the tail if this is my control flow and if I store these instructions in my cache would it be good super under condition that number one next time when I visit it again you should go the same way <laughs> okay so in my program very often the execution flow is very stable especially for part of my programs if that's the case if I have some mechanism to measure the stability of such a control flow then I can store this in my cache line and take very good use of my cache line problem number two address discontinuity you see in the regular cache line the first block the first byte is always 000, zero, zero followed by 001 zero, followed by whatever but this time this is not a story addresses could be discontinuous from here to there how do you manage that number three whoops the tail gets clipped off leaving part of it on the outside so should I clip it from here or clip it when it fills the line which one is easier to manage okay so this is all about the trace cache I need to first find a very likely path once I found it I, I call it a trace and when I have a trace I store the traces in my cache lines and from then from then on my cache will be very efficient okay what if it doesn't go this way okay so for such a design the CPU usually has two caches one is the trace cache and the other one is the regular cache if I hit in here I use it if I don't hit in here then still I have the regular cache okay you understand how the how the regular cache operates okay so for such a system usually it's for high performance this is extra cost and uh, better yet do you understand x86 processor x86 processor now actually has the risk core no more the sys core okay so when i write the x86 program the instructions are in the sysc form yet the real execution is the risk type so whenever i see a sysc instruction if i have the trace cache this sysc instruction may be translated into four fixed length risk instructions right called micro operations right <coughs> so the decoder already did the translation why not store the translation also into my trace cache so that next time I don't need to translate it again I can simply fetch them and use them making things very efficient okay so that's all about trace cache hope you know what I'm talking about and then bus can be split bus transactions can be split similarly memory can be pipelined 
to allow for multiple transactions or cash accesses to take place simultaneously. Okay, and cash, like the memory, can be modulized in whichever way which may help for your application. Okay, and when cash is, has a miss, can subsequent access continue? Because the miss will take cycles or tens of cycles to recover. Can subsequent accesses continue? The answer is possibly if I add a few buffers in my design. So you do your miss, I do my access. Okay, if that's the case, then I can do hit under miss. That means if I have a miss, I can continue to hit my cache. Or better yet, I can miss and then miss, doubling the requirements of my buffers because I need to know what I'm missing. Okay? So, hit on the miss, or more advanced, miss on the miss, or even miss on the miss, on the miss, on the miss, <laughs> depending on how, on how many levels of buffers you want to add in your design. So, that cache is no more blocked. It's called non blocking cache. And then, reducing miss penalty, we can have critical word first. Have you heard of fast restart? Fast restart means if I have a miss, this is a long cache line, right? If I have a miss, then I begin access from here, 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 here. Ah, this is the word I'm missing for. So once I hit this point, I can restart my CPU. This is a fast start. But what about critical word first? Critical word says, no, 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 don't begin from the beginning. Begin from right here. And once this is seen, let the CPU continue, and then I'll miss the other parts in, in the background. Okay, so can you see the critical word first difference from the fast restart? Yes? No? Are you still with me? <laughs> if I start from the beginning of the block until I hit the word I need, that's early restart. But however, if I start right from this word, then that's critical word first. See the difference now? I don't care. <laughs> it's up to you whether you want to make it clear or not. Okay, right buffers. For the write through, CPU, expect delays. <laughs> I still need a few minutes. CPU, cache. If I'm using the write through policy, then Every write to the cache will need to write through to the memory, yet memory is too slow. So I don't want the memory to tie the speed down. What can I do? Put the write buffer here. And the write through writes only through to here and let this buffer to write back to the memory in the background. Don't interfere with my CPU execution. I'm very quick. Okay, so this is the so-called write buffer. A write buffer entry is also that big. So if one write has a dirty word here, if the other write has a dirty word here, do you think we can combine these two writes? If these two dirty words belong to the same block? Of course, for many writes, 
the dirty words are here, and then here, and then here. They are all sequential, subsequent ones. So if you can merge write buffer, uh, you can merge write in the write buffer, that will also help speed up your CPU. Compiler optimization, of course, like matrix multiplication times this column, row times this column, row times this column. For a row major machine, this will be good, this will be misses. For the column major <laughs> machine, <coughs> the situation reverses. But anyway, half of the axis will be misses. So can you do row multiplied by row? Yes, of course, if you do the transpose of the multiplier matrix. Who can do that? Compiler can do that. Or if this matrix is too big, very huge matrix, maybe you can do blocking. Block it into smaller <coughs> matrices and do blocked matrix multiplication to increase the cache hit. How many times this row will be needed in your matrix multiplication? That many times. So there's reuse, right? But if this matrix is too big, way bigger than your cache, there will be misses constantly. Do something about it. Tiling. Splitting it into tiles. Okay, and then reducing miss penalty or miss rate via parallelism, like hardware prefetching. Whenever you access X, check to see X1 is already in the cache. If not, go get it from memory to save some miss penalty. That's a very easy prefetching, right? And hardware can do that perfectly well. Compiler can also do prefetching. If your prefetching pattern is not that predictable, then compiler has more knowledge than your hardware. Let it tell hardware what to prefetch. I'm done.